What's up disc golfers, Joe here with Joe's Disc Golf and wow, the morning challenge, world's drama already, and just some fun stuff out of you disc. I got so much to talk about and it is already pretty darn late. It has been a very, very long week disc golfers here and I'm just ready to do the news just for you. But before we get to that, we have to talk about our lovely sponsor. Log, what rolls downstairs alone or in pairs, rolls over your neighbor's dog, what's great for a snack, and it fits on your back. It's log, log, log. It's big, it's heavy, it's wood. It's better than bad, it's good. Everyone wants a log, you're gonna love it log. Log from Blamo. Yes, there we go, got the sponsor out of the way, and before we jump into the news topics that have been happening this week, including some breaking news that happened earlier this week. Oh, man, we, we've got we've got some fun stuff to talk about there. I've got to talk about a tournament that I played in recently, the 37th annual Three Rivers Open B tier amateur side. A lot going on there. A couple years back, they split the Three Rivers Open to amateur and pro side. Pro side is a C tier or uh, an A tier that has three grand added to it. So I believe there's a few spots left and you can go ahead and sign up now. Head over to Disc Golf Scene and search 37th Three Rivers Open. Shameless plug. Go out, do it. It's a ton of fun. You'll play Tillman Park three times. I only played it twice and it was a blast. You'll play a much, no, not much harder layout, a bit harder layout than what M1 played. And M1, uh, it was it was fun. We channeled our inner Des Moines challenge because we got that front through the day after the Des Moines challenge got theirs out in Des Moines, Iowa. And well, I got to start out my rain filled round. Well, it was really just a rain filled two holes. Well, I say two holes. I mean, one hole. And it was an absolute downpour. Hole one, I'm teeing off in just a torrential downpour. Hole two, it is a sprinkle. And then after that, it just got humid as hell. It was just so hot, so damn hot. I saw one of those little orange guys burst into flames. That's right. It was so hot. Did a little crotch pot cooking. Hot and wet is great when you're with the ladies, but not when you're in the jungle. Not when you're playing disc golf. I may or may not have paraphrased that from a great movie and a great comedian. Go ahead and list that down in the comments below if you know what that was. And I'll let you know if you were right. So round one played decent, I guess. Like I finished it and all the guys on the card were just like, yeah, you know, I played good. I didn't play bad. I didn't play great. I just played all right. You know, four down, third card, top of the third card. There was like seven of us tied at four down, seven or eight of us, something like that, tied at four down. It was something crazy. Second round, I got my buddy shout out to RJ from Half in the Bag and One Geek and One Nerd College Football Podcast. Go check them out for all of your podcast stuff related to college football. They've got some great stuff there. Awesome, awesome stuff. And so we got that going. He was there. He was on the bag and he did a fantastic job. He did a lot of great things that, you know, to the outside observer might not seem great. Things like don't be an idiot and don't be stupid or you got this or Hey, dumbass, don't do that. Again, might have paraphrased that last one, but nonetheless, it, it helped. It helped a ton. Uh, I managed to go from shooting a four down to a nine down, two off the hot score. Uh, at one point, apparently, I in uh, on the turn, after the turn, I did not look at the scores. My caddy, RJ, was not on the scorecard. Two of the other guys were taking care of that. Nobody talked about scores. The rest of the card wasn't doing so great. They were doing okay. Um, and I ended up, uh, apparently was in the lead at one point, ended up bogeying a hole I should have never bogeyed. Uh, it was hole 16, the Smith Brothers holes. And, uh, they, uh, on that hole, it's a 200 foot chip hyzer forehand. I've got this in my sleep. Well, round one, I hit a tree branch that knocked me down. I was about 25 feet short. And I was like, okay, I got to adjust my throat, change a few things. Was not 25 feet short. I was hitting a tree down the ravine and had a crazy um, upshot there, missed the 30 footer, just completely airballed it. I, I don't even know what to say about that. 
just complete airball on that. Just just a misfire. Just like, whoop. oh, wait, the basket's over there. I threw it over there. I, I, I thought, you know, I'm throwing a judge. That thing, that thing is overstable. I was expecting it to hyzer out. I just it was a bad shot. It, that's all it was. It was a bad shot, but uh, made the comeback to save the bogey. End up birdieing. Um, missed the birdie on 19. There were 19 holes on there. Missed the birdie on hole 19 to take solo third place. Instead, there's a massive tie for fourth place, and there's a two way tie for second and a solo winner. Shout out to a uh, Big B Disc Golf out there. Uh, follow him on Instagram. Good guy, great guy, very competitive, very fun to play with. Um, we were obviously not on the same card. He was on the lead card. I was on third card. But like I said, there's so many people all bunched up. The hot round, I believe, was seven or eight down from round one. And then nine, uh, 11 down was the hot round on the second round. Not the same people shooting all those. So it was just kind of a hodgepodge all over the place. I Like like I said, RJ helped out a ton. Uh, having a caddy was a blast. I'm I'm working on writing something up. Ran out of time this week. Apparently work, real life, it's in the way. But um, yeah, that, that's about that. Um, it was a good time. We had, we had a blast. I really appreciated him. Ended up walking away with some, a good chunk of funny money. Let him pick any disc he wanted and pick the cheapest disc out there because he wanted to try a soft maiden. And no, that is not what she said. That is the maiden from uh, Latitude 64. I believe it's latitude. Yeah, it's latitude. And um, yeah, that, that was that was that. That was a lot of fun there. Speaking of latitude 64, here's something I didn't talk about in there. Uh, UC Marisma was uh, arrested, tried and convicted for buying sex from an adult person in Sweden. Uh, apparently that is against the law there. I'm not a an expert, nor do I even have a passing knowledge or glancing knowledge or even Wikipedia wasn't that much help. Um, but he was uh, that's a no no there. And you can't do that. On top of that, he's married with children. And so this is a big hit to his uh, his family, his friends. It was a shock to the disc golf community and all that stuff. There have been takes all over the board here from like, what's the big deal to? Oh, my God, he needs to resign. Uh, so what he did was against the law and we should never break the law. That's simple as that. Uh, you have to follow whatever rules on top of that, uh, from a moral side of it, that's just not a cool thing to do. Uh, cheating on your spouse. Um, I don't, it sounds like it was a very limited personal statement. You could probably find it still on his Instagram. Uh, disc mania also put up a post that he will be taking an extended leave of absence to work on this. Uh, he said he's going to work on it to make himself better. Um, the way he phrased a few things, it was hard to tell if he has maybe um, whether it was a moment of weakness, potentially a moment of uh, maybe he, he has um, a sexual addiction or maybe he's unhappy in his marriage. I don't know. I'm not speculating on any of that. There are a wide variety of reasons why someone would want to do that, but it sounds like he's going to take the time to make himself better, figure out this problem and move forward. So I wish him the best of luck. As I've said with other people, I will uh, take him at his word, but I'm going to follow his actions and actions always speak louder than words. So he can tell me anyone can tell me anything, but I want to see what you do. I want to know that you're trying to make a difference and trying to get better, whether that is uh, the Brody Paul situation, whether that is Nico LaCastro, whether that is UC Marisma does not matter. I want to see actions. I want to see tangible proof that you are getting better, that you are working to improve whatever the issue is, whatever it is. I don't care what it is. So uh, wish him the best. Um, I can't imagine what his wife and his family is going through, what his friends are going through. It'll be interesting to see if this affects Simon Lazat at all. It, and Simon mentions him a lot in his blogs. It sounds like they're pretty close. So I'll be curious if this uh, impacts him at all with Worlds coming up. I, I doubt it. It seems like uh, Simon is a has upstanding character and a resilience. So this shouldn't bother him theoretically too much. But honestly, we'll see. So we'll again wish him the best of luck. Getting into the Des Moines challenge. Robert Burridge is freaking good. Uh, he was just competing as an amateur. 
still actually competing as an amateur, won the college amateur national singles this year, won M nationals last year. This is by far his best elite series win this year. He was 95th at Ledgestone, 44th at OTB, 42nd at Deglo, 2nd at Des Moines Challenge. He's still currently playing Ultimate Frisbee and playing at University of Michigan. Boo! Go line I go. Honestly, I think anybody who's a fan of the Big Ten can go, Boo, Michigan! Except the people who are Michigan fans. But, you know, this is probably one of the few times that I will agree with Michigan State. Um, Ann Arbor's a whore. But, um, I'm sorry, what was that? Um, he, his composure during the final round was amazing. It looked like he'd been there before. Yes, he'd been competing and he won college nationals and he won AM nationals the year before, but he was in the spotlight here. He didn't get starstruck playing against Simon Lazad. He was very composed, very just practical about it. Um, he never really seemed nervous. He always seemed focused and he acted like he'd been there before. He acted like he belongs there. Like I, Robert Burridge is a name that as soon as he graduates college, I, I don't know uh, how old he is, if he's a sophomore or junior, senior, whatever. I think he's someone we have to watch out for on tour coming forward. Now, obviously, Ledgestone, OTB, Deglo, not great. And everything could have just hit just right for his game with the way Des Moines played. And he could have just played out of his freaking mind and we'll never see him again. Or what I'm likely to think after watching his game, his game looked pretty complete. It looks like that once he can finally work on his game and just focus on his game and just just focus completely on that instead of juggling school, juggling ultimate frisbee and all that stuff, I think he is going to be another pro that we need to watch out for. I think he's going to be fantastic. Um, he didn't in that playoff. He didn't get the skip that uh, should have been happening. He he managed to hit a stump. That is like, dude, I, I don't I don't even know. And he he hit that thing. And instead of being in the circle, he was 60 something feet long, looking at a death putt with water behind. He ends up laying up to force Simon to make roughly a 40 foot putt. Simon cans it. Good job, Simon. I mean, that's that's awesome. Um, he put the pressure on Simon. He, he was able to do that. Uh, now, you say could have, would have, should have. Maybe a few things change in the past. Maybe a few things change earlier in the round, in the in the playoff. But it is what it is. I think um, laying up was statistically the smartest thing he could have done. Yes, he could have run the putt. And if he makes it, cold as ice. Terminator. Man, Iceman. He is all in. And everybody is singing his praises going, that was so brave, so awesome. He chains out, rolls OB, hits the cage, rolls, rolls OB, airballs it. Could have happened. Rolls OB, goes OB, whatever. Then, well, you know, he doesn't uh, he doesn't win. Simon pitches up and then it's a tap in win. So I think statistically he made the best thing. Now, Simon was doing fantastic from circle one, and this was about 40 feet. And that is right about that range at the pros where it's just kind of like, you know, it's not they're going to make it more often than they miss. But this was a high pressure, high pressure situation. This was something where it's like, I'm right. You know, I like my odds where I'm going to make you put the pressure on and make you make a putt. So can't really can't really fault the guy for that. Uh, I'll be excited to see how he finishes out the rest of this year and what tournaments he's going to be in. And speaking of Simon Lazat, third Elite Series win of the year. He is tied with one Richard Waisaki, sponsored by Dynamic Discs. And Simon Lazat, sponsored by Discmania, all made by Latitude 64. I see a conspiracy forming. Hmm. Who knows? Uh, last few tournaments, he has not been, Simon has not been great. He hasn't been bad, but he hasn't been great. Ledgestone 26th, Idlewild 22nd, European Open 16th, Deglow 10th. I don't know. I think uh, I think he's not too concerned, not too happy playing in the woods, in the woods, eh? But over there, hey, there goes one. Pew, pew. Hey, you shot my cow. Uh, it's the second week of deer camp, don't you know? But 
So he was able to birdie out from hole 14 to force the playoff, which was amazing. Uh, it was a shootout through the playoff with uh, some weird stuff, including the Mando, Mando, where, wherefore out thou Mando? Who knew changing the Mando rule would end up with such elite series controversy? Sarcasm. Hashtag sarcasm. So what ended up happening is Simon made the Mando, hit a tree. It's a double Mando, made the Mando, hit the tree went, rolled back, ended up potentially crossing into the restricted zone. Here's the thing, though. The restricted zone line was not painted all the way. It was just kind of an arrow. Not cool. Uh, They should have painted that line a lot further. But hey, you know what? We're all human. We all make mistakes. We probably thought the, the guy painting, whether that was tournament director or some other club volunteer, probably was like, no one's gonna end up over here. This isn't gonna happen. And guess what they did? So they end up staring at it for like five minutes, just going, I don't know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Eh, 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 eh. Jeff Spring was there, and he's like, I don't know, I can't tell, like, looks like maybe it could be, but if I cock my head to this side, if I cock my head to the left and close my right eye, he's fine, but if I cock my head to the right and close my left eye, he's not fine. I don't know, but when I stand on my head, everybody's upside down and I feel like I'm in Australia. I I just don't know what's going on. Uh, They stared at it for a long time. And the way the rule is written, you cannot cross through the restricted area. It doesn't matter from which direction. You could have made the Mando, hit a tree and come backwards and cross through that line. You have to go to either A, the drop zone, or B, if there is no drop zone to the previous line. In this case, it would have been a re-T. So what ended up happening, he had to re-T. I said, whatever. Uh, I think that gave him a better lie in the end. I think it was Reti. I can't remember now. I'm going off the top of my head. It's late, guys. I'm sorry. Either way, there's a lot of controversy around the Mando, and that was the important part. And um, I'm shocked that it took this long to come up on coverage. But if we really think about it, generally speaking, there aren't that many Mandos on tour. Now, when you're going through it, you're like, okay. Or they're Mandos that it's like, well, yeah, I mean, technically, yes, you can miss it, but there's so much space to the left. Like, if it's a left Mando, you have to go to the left, then, you know, generally there's enough space and it's not too bad. Or it's so egregious when you do cross it, you're just like, yep, that, I did that, <laughs> went the wrong way, whoopsie, whoopsie doodles. Um, the rule has confused people from the beginning. PDGA had put out a clarification and. Well, the rule as stated says if it clearly enters through the restricted area and I am of the mindset like some other podcasters out there that with how long it took to try to figure this out, I think you can make a sane argument saying I don't think he's I don't think it was clear whether or not he went through it taking that long. It's not like it's not like he grip locked the hell out of it and it just clearly missed the Mando or vice versa. Like he lets go early and clearly misses the other double Mando. This one was just kind of there and you know, it is what it is, but this rule needs to be probably rewritten or as the, the vocal, the, the chorus grows louder. The disc golf pro tour needs to just adopt like, 90% of the PDGA rules and just go, all right, you know, these 90 rules make sense for the pro tour. These 10 don't goodbye. We don't need them. We're going to also add in like five of our own rules because honestly, let's face it. Once you get to the disc golf pro tour and you're proing touring pro ratings don't really matter that much. They matter a little bit for registration, but I think as the tour is continuing to grow, you're not going to be able to get onto tour without proving yourself at Silver Series. And maybe the Silver Series still runs regular PDGA rules so you can get some kind of rating system working with that. Or you just throw the PDGA ratings out the window and do your own thing and just go, all right, you know, if you win X amount of tournaments or if you place high enough in X amount of tournaments, you can apply for a tour card or whatever. And, you know, the top uh, 10 Silver Series finishers from MPO and FPO get 
access to a tour card. The bottom 10 from the pro tour get dropped off. Sorry, Charlie. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. Who knows? I don't know. On top of that, as I had mentioned before, it's raining, it's pouring, the old man is snoring, and holy crap, the pros need to stop bitching about the weather. It's an outdoor sport. You're pros. You have to deal with it. It kind of sucks that, yes, the lead card, chase card, and I think a couple other cards, I can't remember exactly, couldn't tee off on Friday, and they got postponed to Saturday morning. So they played two rounds on Saturday morning. Is that ideal? No. Are we going to get your best effort out of it in that second round? Because you're probably more tired than you're used to because you don't play rounds like that. No, we're probably not. And conditions were definitely different between Friday and Saturday. It happens. But guess what? You got to quit your bitching and deal with it. You're a pro. Here's the thing. The ones who were there, the ones who were at the top of those cards, didn't necessarily need to be there for that round. They could have just been like, deuces, I'm going to go prep for Worlds. See ya. Whatever. Sometimes weather happens, and we have to make adjustments. I commend the Pro Tour for calling it. Lightning got within 10 miles of the course, and everywhere, trust me, this is literally my job, is to warn my athletes, my coaches, my spectators, when there's lightning in the area. I actually had to help do that at this tournament at the Three Rivers Open. I used the app I used for work and was like, hey, tournament director, uh, yeah, lightning is much closer than it appears. You gotta, we gotta delay for a half hour. And we did, and it was fine. And it blew over and we were all good. Things changed there. They were kind of looking at it and just going, all right, the storm cell passed through. It was close enough. Didn't quite hit the course. There were supposed to be more storms supposed to come in shortly after that ended up not coming in. So some people were a little frustrated with that. Honestly, like Jeff Spring and the tournament director there, it like you're damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of situation. Now, you could have sent them out there and I bet you the rain would hit and you don't send them out there. The rain dissipates. It, it is what it is. It, it's unfortunate, but it, it kind of kind of sucks but you know what else sucks Paige Pierce and the run in with the Emporia 5-0 they're coming to get her so this happened this was breaking news uh not a lot of information on Monday when this happened more information has come out since so gonna go through the facts of the case as stated between Ulti World and the Emporia Gazette on August 22nd Paige Pierce went to Emporia Country Club to practice uh, she went around, front door was locked, went to the back, found an employee. It was like, hey, can I get out and practice? And the employee was like, yeah, sure, whatever, I don't care. Uh, employee gave her a cart key. She threw a few shots. Uh, apparently after that, a young man approached her saying, hey, uh, course is closed. Um, apparently the course is closed on Mondays uh, for members only events. So sorry, whatever. She asked about becoming a member to be able to practice. Uh, things kind of went back and forth on that. Now, what was unclear at the time was whether or not information had gotten out to the disc golfers attending Worlds, whether or not, you know, information was out there saying like, hey, the course is closed. Hey, this is when it opens, this and that. So a confirmation packet was dated and sent out on July 25th, emailed to everyone who is registered to Worlds. So here is the important section here, and I will have a link in the description below so you can go read the whole thing yourself. It's rather boring. It's got some OB stuff and it's got like, this is where you park. This is blah, blah, blah. Here is the important section here. The Emporia, Court the Emporia Country Club and the Supreme 18 Disc Golf Course at Jones Park are open for practice before Pro Worlds from dawn to dusk without charge, starting on Friday, Friday, August 26, 2022. The Supreme 18 Disc Golf Course at Jones Park is a public park and can be practiced between dawn and dusk on days before August 26, unless another event is planned on the site. The Emporia Country Club is a private facility and is a pay-to-play. If players want to practice the course before August 26th, they need to check the disc golf course schedule and pay the greens fees to play. There's also more information and a link 
to the Emporia Country Club website, specifically the disc golf section of their website, so you could get all the information you want. So either um, Paige Pierce did not read her email, she forgot about this, she, who knows, okay? So adding to this, according to the world's uh, requirements, part of the bid process and all this, the tournament layouts aren't required until four days prior to the start of the event for practice. TD Doug Birkis is compliant with this, given that the reservation starts on 826 and the tournament starts 830. So 31. So it's you got four practice days. Sorry, math. I just added four, not four practice days and whatever. You get where I'm going. You, you're picking up on them laying down. So now we can let's let's take a, a, a little tangent here. So uh, as Paige Pierce has mentioned in many of Instagram stories, mostly last year, mostly directed at uh, the disgraced PDGA president, Justin Minichelli, uh PDGA, you need to do better. Now, I think we need to update the world's bid process. One, OK, I've seen a lot of people bitching and moaning online about how the DDO courses, uh, Emporia Country Club and Joan Supreme, they're not appropriate for worlds. They're not good enough. They're not this. They're not that. Well, tough love buttercup, because guess what? Nobody else put in bids. All right. So are there better cor courses to host worlds? Potentially. Yeah. Uh, did anybody put in a bid to run worlds? No. So here we go. You're going to call me a gatekeeper, but I'm going to say get off your ass and go get your course together. Go get your local club together and go. All right. We want to try to host worlds. Let's put a bid process together. Let's see. Do we have two courses that could be championship level? If not, all right. See if you have a neighboring course, a neighboring town where you guys can work together and do something. But if you're going to sit there and bitch and moan about ha not having a great course for worlds, you need to go out and find one. You need to help support those who put in the bid process. Maybe donate money somehow through the different various organizations. Maybe donate, volunteer some time, try to work the event, try to help set up the event. I don't know. All I'm saying is, if you're going to complain, try to make it constructive. Don't just say these courses suck. We should have went somewhere else when nobody else put in a bid. There we go. OK, so getting back on the rails here. A little while later, a woman was running down the fairway saying that she's calling the cops. Now, there is communicate. There is a communication dispute between Paige Pierce and the Emporia Country Club staff. So Nate Perkins is going to be her caddy and was with her when this all happened. So Nate Perkins said that uh, Pierce was insistent about becoming a member or renting the facility for her and other players to practice. Secondhand sources claim that Pierce was extremely rude and flaunted her wealth in the conversation with the Emporia Country Club staff. Emporia Country Club declined comments when talking to the Gazette and to Ulti World. So a little bit of he said, he said, she said, I, you know, I don't know. It, it, two things could be true at once. Two things could be true at once. Now, Pierce could have been like, hey, you know, I want to rent out the whole place. How much is it going to cost me to rent the whole course, whole day? What's it going to cost? And People could have taken that. The country club could have taken that as like flaunting her money. Like, oh, I'm just going to buy this all out. <laughs> I have so much money. Uh, it could have been seen as that. So it, it both things could be true at the same time. Uh, Nate Perkins and Paige Pierce could be lying. Emporia Country Club could be lying. They both could be lying. They both could be telling the truth. They both could be misrepresenting their story intentionally, unintentionally. I don't know. I wasn't there and there's no video evidence. Pierce did make a statement through her agent, Blake Schaefer of Schaefer Sports Management. When Paige asked to speak to a manager, the request was denied. Paige believed this to be a miscommunication. She was then told by another employee of the country club that they will be calling the police. Paige collected her things and decided to leave the course. She was not escorted from the course and was not approached by any police. This is a non-issue and a misunderstanding as she was trying to practice for the world championship only eight days before they begin. Paige is looking forward to competing and is focused on winning her sixth world championship. 
So police were dispatched. I think I believe it was around 1130 a.m. And they stated to the Emporia Gazette that they did not encounter Paige Pierce or anybody else. Jeff Jacquard, the PDGA director for competition, said that to this said this to the Emporia Gazette. I can't express enough our disappointment on our organization's end. Sometimes these players just get a little too demanding and don't understand the amount of work it takes to make these events happen and the partnerships that are created. And we really don't like damaging partnerships. So again, I think we need to look at the amount of practice time because this is kind of reminiscent of the shenanigans that happened in in Worlds 2021 where Brody ended up renting out the disc golf course. Minichelli disparaged both Brody and Paige saying that people were making fun of her and blah, blah, blah. And everybody's like, what are you talking about? It's like, oh, it's behind the scenes. I'm like, yeah, dude, you're projecting. You're just saying you're making fun of her. You don't like her because she's calling you out on your BS. Brody's making you guys look bad because he's renting out the whole driving range because either A, players want to use the whole thing or they don't want to get hit in the back of the freaking head with a golf ball. Like, seriously. Ah, okay. So I think we all need to just work at and next year, it might be a little bit too late. But uh, for the 2024 Worlds, we need to kind of update this process. You know, maybe even 2023, if we can get some stuff through, give them like a week to practice. I think a week is a pretty solid amount of time. So Paige Pierce then asked if the OB lines could be painted at Jones Supreme early, and that would be this past Monday, the 22nd. The initial plan was to wait for the uh, city to mow the grass, which they're going to do on Thursday. That would be today, the day of recording, and then they would paint the lines. So they put down temporary lines, and now they're going to end up repainting those lines again on today, Thursday, the day of recording. So if nothing else that we have seen from this, this looks bad for the PDGA, for Dynamic Discs, for the local disc golf scene, for Doug Bierkus. And it, it, that's how it comes across. Right, wrong, or indifferent. That's how it comes across. And I think, like I've said a couple times already, we need to reevaluate how we approach majors and worlds in general. Worlds is supposed to be the top of the top, the upper echelon. You're going to get the best of the best of the best, sir. Ha, another movie reference. So what can we do about that? Again, I think giving a week is probably an appropriate amount of time. Like right now, there was another tournament so everybody left des moines and went to emporia okay maybe it's a week maybe it's two weeks i think a week is probably good enough we'll see i'd like to get some input from the pros i know that um playing a course blind is tough or playing with limited practice is tough yes they did play dynamic discs open they had some practice rounds there they had some obviously tournament rounds But it was like 45 mile an hour winds and the winds are only supposed to be around 15 this time. So. I don't know. I don't know. It'll be it'll be interesting to see what we got going there. Moving on to the last topic is the real time course traffic for UDisc Pro users. This was just released the other day and UDisc Pro will let you know how full the course is based on a couple different factors, including histogram. So on average, you know, the last you know, two months. How busy is the course? Thursdays at 10 a.m., 11 a.m., 12 a.m., well, 12 p.m. Haha, I know my times. How busy is it right now? Now, they will only take information using the same kind of system as uh, Scorecast. So if you share your card, your live card with any of your friends, it will just kind of grab that and just go, oh, hey, look, so and so is recording around right now. There's one person, there's two people, there's five people, there's whatever. And let you kind of know it is not a perfect system. Not everybody uses UDisc, but I think this is pretty fantastic. I can I know in my area in the Fort Disc Golf Club area, I'd say probably 90 percent of the people record UDisc or at least have one person on their card that is using UDisc. So what would be great is just go like, oh, okay, uh, Mastodon is pretty full, but uh, Tillman's pretty empty. All right, I'm going to go play Tillman today or I'm going to play Sweeney East. Sweeney West looks pretty busy. Who knows? I think it's a great feature. Uh, I love some of the things they've added recently. 
being able to change which T pad you're you're teeing off from, because sometimes we'd like to play a mixed layout in terms of like a lot of our courses have multiple T locations, even some multiple pin locations. Sometimes multiple pins are in at the same time. Very rare and uh, mostly just at Tillman Park, usually hole 14 or hole 10. But that's due to other situations. And on top of that, I, you know, if like I want to play, you know, I really like playing this one from the gold tee rather than the black tee. I, you know, maybe I'll just go with gold. That's a pretty good, pretty good time. So I think that about wraps it up. We had a lot of good stuff to talk about there. A lot of fun stuff. Oh, man, I talked about a lot. I covered a lot here and it is only about 35 minutes. You're welcome. Keeping it quick, keeping it simple. Thank you all for watching. I appreciate all of you. All the people who have subscribed recently, all the people who have subscribed way back in the beginning, thank you. I really do appreciate you. And, uh, you know, don't forget next time you're out on the tree, on the course, if you get a great tree kick, to thank Treesus. And if you get kicked deeper into the woods, well, you need to repent and reflect because you have transgressed against Treesus and you need to make it better. So thank you all for watching. As always, I've been Joe, you've been awesome, and I can't wait to see you all in the next video.